man, I see some dudes in my fantasy leagues do this same thing year over year over year, make the same draft mistakes, do the same in-season, off-season shit, and it results in the same record, that same seventh place finish. It is disgusting. So today's video, I'm going to expose six reasons why you are bad at fantasy football year over year over year. These are some things that I have learned the hard way over the years of playing this disgusting game. It's the only way you learn in life is by losing, it's by messing things up. Your brain gets a reaction. It says, don't do that shit again. And I've gotten that reaction with many of these things. And I hear pushback from a lot of y'all and you have optimism about a lot of things. Okay. So this is the reason I'm making this video today. You'll know what we got to do. We got to tuck our shirts in. We got to stop yelling. Let's eat. <laughs> Ripping off of that optimism, we're about to go into a negative space because injury optimism is the single biggest problem point for fantasy football players in my experience. Injury optimism, acting as if the injury that a player just had that has a 10-month recovery timetable does not affect them and that they'll be 100% on the field in seven months. It's just not how the world works. I don't care that a beat reporter went to practice and told you that a guy in shorts looks good. They don't have 20 years of practice in the field, 15 years of schooling, and then 19 years of being in the field working with athletes. We have hella dudes in the fantasy football space that make podcasts, that make content, that do this shit, that tell us what we actually should be looking for. We have real timetables behind real injuries. The other problem is that everyone takes these timetables and then looks at the minimum of them. A lot of times, like, yes, a player can come back if an ACL tear return timetable is 9 to 12 months. A player can get back to, you know, 90% of the player in 10 months, but he needs to be 100% on the mental as well. He needs to have the confidence that he can cut and run at full speed and take hits on his knee or whatever it is that's repurposed in order to be back on the field. Otherwise, you can be 80% physical, and if you're not 100% mentally there, guess what? You're getting 60% of the player. The closer we get to the season without this player running full speed at practice and doing everything at 100%, the less likely he is to perform at a high level in fantasy football, right? One thing I always say is don't find injuries in fantasy football because they're going to find you. If a player is going into the season at less than 100%, because we know this from a lot of scientific fucking timetables, I'm going to use the timetable, the word timetable in a nauseating amount, so just tuck your shirt in and get used to it. If a player goes into the year at less than 100%, he has a much higher chance of getting re-injured or just playing at a very slow speed because he does not feel up to speed, okay? We can't predict injuries. We don't know if a player is injury prone. We don't know when injuries are going to happen. But if you are stepping onto the NFL field at less than 100% while everybody else is running at full speed, yes, the likelihood of you being injured is way fucking higher than the rest of the guys. Injury optimism. If a player is not performing at training camp, if it's preseason, has gone through the entire preseason, and this guy is still injured, if he has a hamstring pull a week before the season starts, he's going into the year at less than 100%. That is a problem, and he needs to move down your draft board. There are a lot of players I'm concerned with right now, like J.K. Dobbins, for instance, had the ACL tear, but he also had something else on top of that. It wasn't a good ACL tear. You know, None of them are fucking good, but he had a, he had a bad one. We'll put it that way. He had a bad one. He is not on the field yet, and Jim Harbaugh is actually showing concerns about it, right? And this is something to keep a really strong eye on. So you can't just say, if he's healthy, he's going to be a top 15 running back. The if he's healthy part is a fucking huge factor, and we have a lot of facts to go behind that, okay? So when a player is injured, if he's going into the year injured, he needs to move down your draft board. You can't just look at best case scenario for a player because there are so many worse scenarios that typically end up being what happens when a player is injured. So that is number one. You're not taking injuries seriously enough for the amount of facts and science that we actually have in order to tell you about the injuries. Number two, not actually following these preseason reports, okay? I went in depth on this with Traylon Burks in a couple videos back. There is a very glaring signal when you start seeing reports from 
beat reporters, multiple beat reporters, like one from the athletic, one from the Titans local newspaper, then reports from coaches, positional coaches, head coaches, front office, other players, right? I don't know if we're there yet with Traylon Burks, but I'm saying these are the reports you need to start listening to because everybody gets like the most positive reports during the summer. Everybody's in the best shape of their lives. Everybody knows the offense so much better. Everyone's way more comfortable in the offense. Like everything is positive. So when you start to see negative reports stack up over and over and over again, where there's smoke, there is fire. There's usually something to it. People don't just sit at practice for four hours and say like, damn, he was doing something fucking terrible all practice for no reason. There is a reason they do their jobs, these beat reporters and these other guys. So when they start stacking up and there's multiple problems from multiple angles, I'm not talking about just one report of a guy who dropped passes at camp. I don't care about that shit, right? That's one thing. If this guy is bad conditioning, plus dropping passes, doesn't know the offense, he's running as the wide receiver for all camp. If these things start to pile up and, you know, the coach comes out and says he's not where we want him to be right now, these are things you need to, to pay attention of. One report, let it go. Two reports, whatever. You start seeing three, four, five things pile up from three, four, five different sources. You have a problem with that player. He needs to move down your board. On that note, in the preseason, you guys are going to kill me. You'll, y'all... One time past the vibe check. One fucking time. I'm, I'm going to tell a little story from last preseason. This this rule number three is you're not zoning in during the preseason games. We have so many good resources for following snap counts with the first team offense in preseason games. This is the only, like, we, we hear reports all offseason, you know, after the NFL draft, at OTAs, at mini camp, at training camp, you know, during team scrimmages. This is literally the closest actual thing we're going to get to game situations when they're on the field in preseason and the starting quarterback is under center we are getting a glimpse into how this team wants to operate with their starting team okay we get a look at who is the wide receiver three who are the two wide receivers starting and two wide receiver sets what happens on third down is the starting running back being pulled for a better pass catcher what happens when they're on the goal line they don't waste time there's no reason to put Dak Prescott on the field if you're not trying to simulate what a Dak Prescott drive is going to look like in the regular season. These coaches are running these offenses like this for a fucking reason, to get ready for the regular season, okay? You have time and practice to fuck around and try different things and experiment. The preseason is for getting them ready for the regular season. Last year, okay, Miles Gaskin was a great example, right? The first game, Miles Gaskin split carries with every running back in the backfield while the starters were under center. And I said, he needs to move down your draft board really, really drastically because this is going to be a committee in Miami. The coaching staff started saying so. They said, we have a bunch of guys that can contribute on all three downs. They never once committed to Miles Gaskin. Y'all were in love with Miles Gaskin. We're going to put a lot of the comments on the screen because the next game, the next, the very next game, Miles Gaskin scored two touchdowns against the third string of the Atlanta Falcons defense. You guys look at statistics, not snap counts. We want to see what the what the game is going to be played like, not how well you're going to run the ball against a third string defense. I don't care about yards per carry. I don't care how many touchdowns you score. The statistics in the preseason don't give a fuck. The playing time, how many snaps you're getting, the percentage, the share of the snaps you're getting with the starting quarterback on the field is the most important thing. I told y'all Miles Gaskin was going to be in a committee. He scores two touchdowns in the second preseason game against the third string Atlanta Falcons defense. And I had 200 floods saying, I'll take, I'll take, I'll take. This didn't need well. This didn't need well. This didn't need Like, shut the fuck up. Shut up. This happened with like five other players last year. Miko Harmon was another one, right? It was like, Miko Harmon didn't even play the first game. He was like playing 16% of the snaps with the starters. I said, stop drafting Miko Harmon. He's not playing with the starters. The second game rolled around. Tyree Kill didn't play in the preseason. Miko Harmon had like five catches for 60 yards. Oh, look at Mahomes targeting him. Yeah, of course he's going to fucking target him. His, his two top weapons are not playing right now. And it was just, I'll take, I'll take, I'll take. If they age well. Oh my God, you guys are going to kill me someday. Like, I'm, you're so nauseating. I remember, like, this happens every fucking time, too. You guys just go nuts about, like, the first play, the first touchdown, the first whatever. You guys are, you just want a quick nut, but you never look at the bigger picture, okay? The biggest takeaway from the preseason games is seeing how the committees are running, seeing how the wide receivers are running when the starting quarterback is on the field. Number four, the fourth reason why you are not a good fantasy football player is you are strictly betting on talent. This is something I've been talking about as it relates to Kenneth Walker so many times this offseason. You bet on talent over the situation. In redraft and season-long leagues, you should be weighing towards situation and opportunity over talent. If you play Dynasty, that's when you bet on talent because talent wins out over the long run. However, 16 games ain't fucking long, people. 17 games ain't long. 
It's not long enough for that to be the biggest sample size. These rookies take a long time to get acclimated to it. So if you're only betting on talent because you like a player, you're going to end up hurt and drafting bad players. Now, Kenneth Walker's ADP is starting to move way, way down. We just did a mock draft on Saturday where Rashad Penny, for the first time I've seen all offseason, went before Kenneth Walker. So bravo. But this happens all the time. We have these rookies that are super exciting. They come in and they just don't have a clear path to touches. And because we like them so much as a talent, we just want them to have the opportunity. But it's just not the case, okay? So next time you love a player, ask yourself objectively. Put the word player X in the situation of whoever it is you like and say, do I still want this guy if I had never watched him play in college or if I never watched him play in year one? Look at the situation objectively and then see how much you actually like that player. So betting on talent works in dynasty, ends up burning you a lot of the time in season long. Number five is regression. Everyone wants to talk about regression, but never puts context behind it, all right? They never put practicality behind it. They just look at a number and say, oh, he didn't score enough touchdowns this year. He's obviously due for positive regression. Homies, like it's just probably not that player's role. It's probably not what they're good at. You need to start putting context behind regression. If a player does really, 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 really fucking well, Cooper Cup was so good last year, he has to regress. He's a bad, you know, the number of times that we talk about like, oh, I could probably find 10 comments on our channel that say like, Cooper Cup's a terrible pick at wide receiver one because no one ever repeats his wide receiver one. It doesn't matter because he could still regress and be the wide receiver one. If you draft him as a wide receiver one and he finishes as a wider as the wide receiver three, that wasn't a bad pick, okay? Yes, statistically, he might've came down a little bit, but just saying that with no context or practicality behind it is the dumbest shit I hear way too often. And the last reason that you are bad at fantasy football that I put on this list is taking arbitrary numbers that don't matter at all and using it as fucking religion. Okay. Kind of goes with the regression thing, but people love to talk about like thousand yard seasons, man. And I, I've gone off about this a bunch of times this off season, but like love to talk about like DJ Moore. We love to talk like Mike Evans, right? Thousand yards. We love to talk about how all these guys continuously rack up a thousand yards or, or some shit like Clyde Edwards Hilaire after his rookie season had a thousand yards from scrimmage, 1100 yards from scrimmage. If you're listening to an analyst talk about that and you hear that, you're like, oh, it's pretty good. They don't talk about how 1100 yards or a thousand total yards from scrimmage for a running back is not hard. Like 25, 20 to 25 running backs a year do that. If you're a starting running back in the NFL over the entire course of the year and you can't hit a thousand yards from scrimmage, that's 700 rushing yards, 300 receiving yards. You're probably not that good of an NFL running back, you know, and I've dropped this stat multiple times as well, but like, you know, Mike Evans, great player, great fantasy player. I'm just talking about in general, the notion of saying like, oh, he goes over a thousand yards. Oh, he goes over a thousand yards. Like I I've been making this point with Brandon Cooks, right? He's gone over a thousand receiving yards in six of the last seven years. I'm not advocating Brandon Cooks being a great play because he has high upside. A thousand receiving yards is nothing that's crazy, right? The number of pass catchers that have gone over a thousand receiving yards in each of the last like four to five years is around 25. There's almost like 25 to 28 players every year that go over a thousand receiving yards. So being like, oh, this guy went over a thousand yards. It's not a needle mover in fantasy, okay? So these arbitrary numbers that you listen to people talk about, make sure you go look and see if that even fucking matters. What is a thousand receiving yards amongst 28 players that do it? That's a wide receiver two. That's a wide receiver three. And I'll tell you what, the gap between the wide receiver 20 and the wide receiver 40 really ain't that big. Let me look it up right now. Last year, the number of wide receivers that cracked a thousand yards was 23. Last year, the wide receiver 20 and half PPR was Hunter Renfro, 12.2 fantasy points per game. The wide receiver 40 was Russell Gage at 10 points per game. We're talking about a 20 ranking gap in these two players, wide receiver 20 to 40, you're looking at a wide receiver two versus a wide receiver four, five, and their difference is two fantasy points per game. So when someone tells you some shit like, oh, he had a thousand receiving yards, that does not mean that he separates from a guy ranked 20 spots below him at a high level. It's just lazy analysis that people like to use to fall back on because they don't know shit. All right. And those are six reasons why you're still bad at fantasy fucking football. If you want more draft strategy, more help, more player analysis, hit the button that looks like this. If you enjoyed the video, join our discord for some free fucking chirps some free chatter. We'll be in there talking fantasy all off season. I love y'all and I'll see you tomorrow.